Hello, welcome back to WTSF, where I answer questions from r slash Street Fighter with in-game examples. I find the common themes for the week on Reddit, you vote for which ones you'd like to see most, and then I'll answer questions based on that theme. This week, what you'd like to see most is Oki and Knockdown Pressure in Street Fighter V. First question by the Rago. Hey guys, I started playing Vega slash Claw about three weeks ago, and I'm currently trying to make it from Platinum to Diamond. I've been playing Karen since the beta, so now I have a lot of new matchups to learn. The biggest of my problems seems to be fighting Mika and Laura, since I have no defensive options. I haven't won a single game against these crazy ladies. Anyone able to help me out? I'm so lost in the need of tips and advice. Thanks in advance. Now I picked this question because even though it didn't mention Oki's enemy, it did mention a lack of defensive options and nothing shows that much better than Mika's amazing Oki aggression that she's got. So right now I've got Claw set to his three framer, so if I do a certain slow move, I will get stopped. Now, Mika does really well in these particular matchups where there is no strong defensive options because of how strong her Okizeme is. Okizeme, which translates from the Japanese for rousing attack, has been shortened into the term Oki and now basically means how strong are your options when the opponent has to wake up after you've knocked them down. And with Mika, there's effectively four different strengths of what she's got here, maybe five. You've got the things that provide no pressure on wake up, and that's to the point that it's not even worth pretending that you've got pressure. She can kind of fake it after the critical art, but if you know what you're looking for, there's not much that she can do there. The next things are things that you can frame kill to the point that the opponent is minus one. These things, you've got a lot of escape options. It's not quite the 50-50 that Mika wants you to think that it is. After that, you've got the things where she can frame kill you down to minus two. You basically have the same escape options in these scenarios, but your punishment for guessing wrong is much, much higher. And lastly, you've got the things that frame kill you down to the point where you are minus three. And these are the only true 50-50 scenarios that Mika has. And that's one of the great things for Mika players. You don't have to remember too many options or too many frame kills either, which allows you to just maul anybody that doesn't have invincibility or any other defensive option when they've been knocked down. Now that said, even though she doesn't have a lot of options, a lot of people don't do their homework. Things that are as straightforward as just not doing a quick recovery can really freak out a Mika that doesn't know their frame kills. With Laura, that can be a little bit scarier because it's just giving her an opportunity to charge a thunderclap. But still, mixing up your wake-ups is going to test their knowledge. That in itself is a defensive option. So, not quick rising is you making the active choice that they don't have the right meaties on deck. And quick rising, whether that's a quick rise straight up or a quick back rise, those are the ones where you're going to make a very conscious choice. Quite often, the choice there is not going to be to push a button. We assume that they're going to have practiced those and are going to be quite comfortable, especially at the Platinum Diamond kind of level. But they do have other options, especially on those minus two and minus one scenarios. So basic grappler theory, one of the first options that people are going to go for is just going to be to hold up. If they do choose a command throw there, you're going to get a great punish off that whip animation. However, if they do anticipate that and go for something with a shorter animation, they are going to hurt you for that. A safer option here for most grapplers is going to be to jump backwards, but then nobody's winning so it's safer but you give up a lot of the screen and that also sets up the mindset that if they guess right they hurt you if you guess right nothing happens and they'll gladly take that trade all day so here we are seeing back dashes and walk backs that escape the uh, command throw option if you do predict the throw you can take the hard read there and do aurora spin edge if you've got the claw on or v trigger one if you've got the claw on or off these are hard reads of course if you do get them wrong you're basically just turning yourself into a grappler putting yourself into that high risk reward category and that's the thing with Street Fighter 5 yes it hasn't got a lot of defensive options but effective use of what few defensive options it does have will get you out of a lot of bad situations a lot of players in Street Fighter 5 very quickly resign themselves to the fact that there's no defensive options when there actually are some and those are awareness of what the opponent's offensive options are committing hard to a defensive decision and just being aware of which ones are more risky than others because that also informs the decision making of your opponent Next question by Lord of the Yes. So does it mean a punch or a kick? Whenever I hear a three frame, I understand what it means, but do they mean a jab or a kick? I normally hear stuff like stand fierce. When I hear three frame, I'm just confused on which light they talk about. So in that last video, you saw that I was using standing light kick as Claw's three framer. Claw happens to have a standing light punch three framer as well, but it requires it to not have his claw on. Generally, when someone is saying a three framer, they are talking about whatever your best fastest option is. 
characters like Claw have more than one three framer that it can choose between. And if we go to Honda here, you can see he doesn't have an option that's three frames. His fastest is four frames. But if someone is just generally saying, use your three framer, what they're saying is use your best fastest button. It may not always be a three frame button. Honda's fastest buttons are four frame. He's got his standing light kick and his crouching light kick, which are both very similar. But there are scenarios where instead of using that fastest button, I might use a five frame crouching light punch like that. Certain lows and other moves might have hitbox properties that go under three framers. So if people are telling you to use your three frame move, they're telling you to use your fastest button. The shape of the hitbox, the priority, they all do come into play as well. If your character has more than one option, take a look at them, see where they hit the opponent, what kind of hitboxes they've got, how far they can reach. Whether they start a good confirm or a good block string is also a really big factor to think about. So that bit's left for you to find out for yourself. Next one here by Schnauzer of Doom. It's about shimmy. When you guys shimmy, are you reacting to the throw or anticipating it? throwing out a move early. When I try to react, it's late pretty much every time. But when I anticipate, sometimes I actually get thrown out of it because my hurt box gets bigger. What works for you? So to understand shimmy, you need to understand the origin of the shimmy. Street Fighter 4, there was something called Crouch Tekken, which is where you would actually hold down and back, and then you would press throw to the beat of the combo that they were doing and then if they chose to mix you up with a throw in the middle of a combo that option select kept your character safe because they could block and tech the throw at the same time that was gone in street fighter 5 and the first thing that people found that was an alternative was something called the jump back tech where you would actually press a throw tech and you would jump back at the same time and on knockdown that was a pretty safe option you would be able to cover a block for a split second when waking up and then you would jump back and manage the throw and what you were doing was you were taking yourself out of a 50-50 but you were giving up screen space as a cost for that. Now that was quite reasonable but it was also quite tame, uh, it took a lot of the action out of the game so they took that out as well and the next thing that players found as a result is what we now call the late tech or delay tech. There's some great videos on how to practice delay tech and I'll include one in the, in the description but basically you're going to crouch block and then press your throw tech for a split second you can defend so if they do meaty it is going to block however there is enough leniency there that if they do choose to do a throw the throw tech will actually take over and again this means that if you just do that every time you wake up you're making yourself safe from both meaties and from throws however there's no reason to not do that every single time so players then found a way of exploiting that kind of predictability of what do we do if somebody does that every single time and the simple answer is to walk backwards and now they have a guaranteed throw with animation in your face. And that itself is what we call the shimmy. So what the shimmy does is it predicts that they're going to go for the throw tech option. And if you get that right, you're going to get a guaranteed counter hit on their whiff animation. It's a very powerful technique if you are aware that the opponent is late tech. So when you're seeing people do that, they've already taken that information from their opponent. The easiest way to find out if your opponent is doing it is to do a meaty throw on their wake up. And likewise, if they're successfully blocking the meaties every single time, you get that impression. How come they can always guess right? Chances are that they're doing the late tech. At this point, you change gears and you start implementing them shimmies. The other thing there is if you are actually getting thrown on their wake up, you're not actually walking far enough out of that range. Shimmy itself is a commitment. You're going to have to move backwards a decent enough range. And now it becomes more reactive because you're walking backwards. You actually see what they're doing. This goes into a concept that we've not really talked about before, which is coupling. When you're making one action, you are looking for something to trigger your next action. So here we've committed to the shimmy. We know we're going to be walking backwards. The only thing we're looking for is, does their character move? And if they do, I'm pressing medium punch. With some characters, you can even get that wrong. And the option that you've got there to whiff punish will be safe. So it can be quite low risk, high reward as well. But layer one, you identify whether or not they're doing a delay tech. Layer two, you adapt and shimmy. Layer three, you see if they're adapting by then doing a wake up button. Layer four, you start doing the meaties again to punish their wake up buttons. And that's just one additional rock, paper, scissors that's gonna be going on in your fights from there on out. Last question by DV, Stoic Face J-Bone is about V-reversal punishing. I swear you can grab certain V-reversals and it's kind of annoying. I was fighting a Honda last night and the V-reversal after my stand and light kick every single time on wake up. I knew he was gonna do it every time so I would try to stand and light kick and then immediately grab but he would beat me with his V-reversal every time anyways. I would think I have enough frames to snuff a V-reversal when I'm plus two on the light kick. 
what's the deal here? So like we said, there's not a lot of strong defensive options in this game. V reversal is one of the few things you've actually got in your arsenal. Different characters have different V reversals. Some are offensive V reversals that actually hit you and move you back. Some switch sides and some just make a very small amount of space. One thing worth mentioning is that V reversals have their own frame data as well. Depending on the kind of V reversal, this will vary. The offensive ones will cause a knockdown or be minus two on block, generally. And as you've mentioned, if you can read them, you can throw through them. That goes for the offensive ones, it goes for some of the side switch ones. Sometimes that might require you to do a small side step backwards or forwards. But in Karen's case here, yeah, you can actually just press light kick and then throw. There is time into it. If I do it too quickly, I will get V-reversals. And you can see just how late I can input that. You can actually just about react to it. Some characters even have option selects that are laced into that idea that there is a decent amount of leniency in there. So with that one, all I can say is practice your timing and practice your space. Because if I creep up here at most ranges, it does work. I think on the absolute cusp, it just doesn't work there. But if you're approaching that from a position of having Oki and doing that from a knockdown, it should just be a matter of timing. And that's whether you're mid-screen or in the corner. And that is it for another week on WTSF. Thanks as always to everyone who takes part in the polls and puts the questions up on Reddit. I'll leave them all in the description so you can see them there, along with some ways of practicing shimmying and late teching. And I'll see you in the next one.